Hello, welcome to BM 6611 Managing Brands, Session 14, Measuring the Sources and Outcomes of Brand Equity. And this is the second video for this session where we're focusing on the outcomes of brand equity. You'll remember in the first video, we looked at the entire concept of the brand value chain, which is shown on the slide here. And this comes from Keller and Lehman's paper, How Do Brands Create Value? And in the last session, we focused uh, particularly on the brand exploratory, uh, the customer mindset as shown here on the diagram, how we measure the knowledge that customers hold in their mind about a brand, the breadth and the depth of awareness, their understanding of what sort of products and services the brand uh, represents, the associations that they have with the brand, their attitudes and so on and so forth. And you'll notice that on the, um, the next two boxes on the diagram, market performance and shareholder value, there are letters B and A. And those relate to Paul Feldwick's paper, one of your compulsory must read papers for this session, where he sets out three meanings or three definitions of brand equity, A, B and C. Meaning C relates to the customer mindset, and we looked at that in the previous video. We're now going to focus on his uh, Feldwick's uh, brand equity definition B, which relates to the market performance box in the brand value chain. And it's here that we start to measure the outcomes of a brand in its own product or service marketplace. Uh, the amount of sales volume that it has, its sales revenue, uh, its profitability and so on. And after that, we'll go on to look at the final component of the brand value chain, which links to Feldwick's brand equity definition A. And that's about shareholder value or the overall aggregate value of a brand. So just to refresh your memory then, here are Feldwick's three meanings of brand equity. We'll start at the bottom um, because uh, the, they link to the brand value chain in reverse order. So meaning C, a description of the associations and beliefs the consumer has about the brand. So that's the customer mindset box on the brand, brand value chain. Uh, and our focus for the next few minutes will be um, meaning B, a measure of the strength of consumers' attachment to a brand, how often they buy it, how many people buy it, how frequently they buy it, what volume they buy it in, how much they're prepared to pay for it, and so on. And we'll come back to A later. So, Feldwick's brand equity meaning B, a measure of the strength of consumers' attachment to a brand. So here we're starting to capture and to measure how the brand is performing in its marketplace. And one way that we can do that is to use what are called um, one of a number of comparative approaches. Uh, these can be divided into to three broad categories. Brand-based comparative methods of assessing market performance, marketing-based comparative methods of assessing market performance, and then a special technique called conjoint analysis. We'll also, as we have always done throughout this module, look at the alternative perspective, and that's why this is in red. Every time we look at the alternative view uh, put forward by the so-called Ehrenbergian group of researchers, then we highlight this in red font so that you can be uh, it's clear to you that this is the alternative perspective. And the Ehrenbergians use some, a technique called the Dirichlet model to develop brand performance measures. So we will have a look at that also. But let's start with these comparative approaches. They help us assess the specific benefits that brand equity provides to an organization. The great benefit of the alternative approach is that it helps us to understand market research data uh, and to establish 
clear benchmarks by which um, brands performance can be judged because it can be quite easy at times to misread or to misanalyze, to misinterpret market research data and a market share figure uh, can look particularly good or particularly bad out of context. And the benefit of the Dirichlet model is to provide um, these benchmarks that say, yes, that is absolutely what we would expect for this brand, uh, that its brand is performing exactly as we would expect, exactly on target. There's nothing to worry about. So the comparative approaches. First of all, the brand based comparative method. Here we are keeping uh, all the elements of the operational marketing mix. Uh, steady and constant and we are doing a research exercise that assesses how consumers respond to two different brands. How consumers respond to a, a focal brand, our own brand and a representative comparison brand. So Audi versus BMW, Coke versus Pepsi or Nike versus Adidas. They are directly comparable brands. So a very good example of such a brand based comparative method would be blind testing. Where a uh, research market research exercise is set up and research respondents are presented with two products. Um, they don't know which is which. They, they presented with two new running shoes. One is Nike, one is Adidas, but the um, identifying marks, etc., have been covered up. So they don't know which is which. And they're asked to look at them, to feel them, to try them on, to wear them, to run with them, and then to provide an evaluation to the researcher which one they prefer, why they prefer it how likely they would buy, be to buy each one, what they would expect to pay for each one. Um, a famous example of this in, in marketing history is the Pepsi challenge. So for many years, Pepsi ran an advertising campaign where they showed on television people blind tasting Coke versus Pepsi. They didn't know which was which, and so they were working purely on the taste. And generally people, when presented with the brands um, covered up, preferred the taste of, of Pepsi. Um, but that didn't stop Coke still being the market leader. So clearly there's a lot more to product purchase and branding than just the basic product itself. But nonetheless, this brand based comparative method is a very important part of market research in assessing how customers respond to a particular um, product and uh, a price, etc. Alternatively, um, or in conjunction, there is the marketing based comparative method to establish uh, market response uh, information. And this type of research assesses how consumers respond to changes in the operational marketing mix for a specific brand. So here we're researching one brand only, the brand is held fixed and the consumers will generally know what brand they are uh, dealing with in the research exercise. So for example, the marketing based comparative method is widely used to evaluate how consumers are likely to respond to a change in price. And so through research, they're presented with um, the, the running shoe, the Nike running shoe or the Adidas running shoe or the Reebok running shoe or whatever brand it happens to be. And they are um, exposed to it at the current price and asked some questions about their evaluation of it, its value for money, how likely they would be to buy it, etc. And then they are exposed to the same product, the same brand at a different price, a higher price and ask the same questions. And in that way, the researchers and the brand management team can evaluate the likely impact of a price change. This can also be used to evaluate other elements of the operational marketing mix, not just price changes. It can be used to evaluate extensions to a brand. 
So um, how likely people would be to buy a, a new type of product or service under an existing brand name, or indeed to look at alternative marketing communications programs. Now, I mentioned conjoint analysis uh, in the preceding slide, and I just want to say a quick word about that. Um, this is a very, very useful market research technique, which is widely used in marketing. It's used in other areas, uh, other subject areas too, but it is widely used in marketing. And it's sometimes referred to as trade-off analysis. It's a very clever um, analytical technique that is all done using computers. So it's a very easy research technique to use with respondents. And respondents are presented sequentially with a product offer, a particular product and a particular brand at a particular price. Um, and they are asked questions about that, how likely they would be to buy it, um, etc. And as the research moves on, the, uh, the computer software iterates through subtle changes to the product and to the price. And that and the con consumer rates and evaluates each bundle of product features and price. And the output from the research exercise is an understanding of the extent to which people uh, trade off product features, functionality, quality for price. And also the technique helps researchers and the brand team to identify the sort of so-called sweet spot, the ideal combination of product functionality, product features and price that is going to maximise the consumer's likelihood to buy. So all of these methods are based on marketing experiments, primary market research, generally using surveys, often conducted online. And as in laboratory experiments that you might do in chemistry or physics, the idea with a marketing experiment is to hold certain variables constant and so that you can look at the effect of another variable. So to hold brand constant, to hold product constant, but adjust price and look at the impact that price change, change has on propensity to purchase or to hold product functionality constant and price constant, but change the brand and to look to see what impact the different brands have on the consumer's propensity to purchase. So these comparative approaches are designed to allow brand teams to collect research data that allows them to explore the impact of their brand and all of the elements of its operational marketing on the consumer's likelihood to purchase. Now, the Ehrenbergians um, take a slightly different view of uh, branding and brand equity. As you know, we've discussed this often on this module and they set out a, 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 set, a set of key brand performance measures which are listed here the most important of which is how many customers buy a brand. In other words, it's market penetration or it's market share. Also, their key in their key performance measures is um, product purchase frequency, how often customers buy the brand over a typical purchase cycle, which might be six months or a year in fast moving consumer goods it might be longer, much longer for things like computers or cars, but over a typical buying cycle, how often will people buy the brand? And the third measure that is very important is the so-called duplication of purchase measure. And this tells us how much the customers also buy other brands. Because certainly in fast moving consumer and fast moving business to business goods, markets, things like um, office sundries, photocopier paper, shampoo, instant coffee, um, uh, light bulbs, uh, etc. Um, most customers are not single brand loyal. In other words, they don't just buy one single brand all the time. They have a repertoire, a small repertoire of brands that they buy within. 
um, sometimes they might just buy on, on price, whatever happens to be the cheapest. Sometimes their usual brand is not available. So they just buy another brand that is available. Sometimes they just want a change, a bit of variety. So the duplication of purchase measure explains uh, or measures the extent to which the buyers of one brand also buy other brands within a product category. So if we think about bottled water, for example, Evian is a leading brand in the bottled water market uh, and it may have a market share of, say, 25 percent. Um, and in a typical year, an Evian customer might buy the brand, say, three times. Um, but those 30 percent of, of consumers who buy Evian will also buy other brands like Volvic or Buxton Spring or Highland Spring or indeed supermarket own label. Now, the thing that the Ehrenbergians have discovered over many years now and have, have shown again and again and again is that these three measures follow rules. They follow well-established patterns and these rules are known as empirical generalizations. They're, they're essentially marketing laws. And these are extremely important in that they explain to us that the most important difference between brands is the number of customers that buy it in the first place. So big and small brands differ quite significantly, very significantly sometimes, in how many customers they have, how many buyers they have in their market share, in their penetration. So Avian may have a penetration of, say, 25%, um, but uh, Fiji water, a much more expensive premium uh, water, might have a penetration of only 3 or 4%. So a huge difference in the number of buyers. But... Um, the, the brands differ much less in how loyal the buyers are. So the frequency of purchase and the regularity and the loyalty are fairly similar across all brands. So uh, the, the average purchase frequency of about three, three and a half times a year won't be similar for all of the bottled water brands in the market for Avian, for Highland Spring, for Buxton Spring, etc, etc. And also, they, they will all share customers. So each of those brands will be bought, um, but each of the customers of these brands will be buying other brands as well. And the mathematical technique that has been used to uncover these well-established patterns, these marketing laws, is the Dirichlet model and it predicts these law-like patterns and also gives clear benchmarks so that brand teams, marketing uh, managers can interpret their market research data. So if they find that their brand is sharing customers with other brands, they may, their first a uh, gut reaction to that might be to think, oh, my goodness, that's dreadful. We, we, we need to build our loyalty. We need to try to get more customers that only ever buy our brand. Our customers are not loyal enough. They're leaking away to our competitors. But the Dirichlet model results would say, no, that's absolutely to be expected. Single brand loyalty is very, very rare. And in actual fact, customers, the few customers who are single brand loyal, in other words, they only ever buy one brand in a market, tend to buy very, very little anyway. They're light buyers and so they're less important. So don't worry about the fact that you're sharing your customers with other brands. That's quite normal and to be expected. So in practice, brand managers will use all of these um, approaches to establishing market performance measures. They will use the Dirichlet uh, brand performance measures. They will also use the marketing experiments and conjoint analysis to evaluate and to forecast and predict the impact of changes in their operational marketing for a brand, uh, the impact that those will have on the performance of a brand in its marketplace. So we've looked now at three 
elements of the brand value chain over the last uh, couple of videos. And now we're going to look at the, the final component, shareholder value. And this relates to Feldwick's meaning of brand equity A. The total value of a brand as a separable asset when it's sold or when it's included on a balance sheet. So let's just think about this concept of a separable asset for a moment. What does that mean? Well, when an, an organization is, is creating its, its accounts, it's setting out its balance sheet, it enumerates its assets, its buildings, its machinery, its vehicle pool may have lorries or a set of cars, etc. All of these assets are counted up and they are valued. Now, tangible assets are easy to identify and they are all separate. They're all unique. They're not joined together. So they are known as separable assets. So an organization can easily sell a factory, for example. Uh, that that set that factory is a self-contained asset which could be sold off to another organization um, if the or company didn't need it any more. So the idea behind brand equity meaning A is to try to um, define a brand within an organization as a separable asset. In other words, to identify um, the brand as something unique, something which is self-contained within the organization that has its own self-contained value, its own self-contained impact on the organization's performance. And this is very useful, uh, very important, in particularly in multi-brand owning organizations like um, Unilever, like Mondelez, like Procter & Gamble, Reckitt Benckiser, etc., who may wish to buy and sell brands. If you want to buy a brand, you need to know how much you're likely to have to pay for it. If you want to sell a brand, you need to know how much to ask buyers for it. Now, there are a number of different methodologies, a number of different techniques for measuring this overall value that a brand has to an organization and hence to the shareholders of an organization. There's a holistic approach um, which simply tries to identify an overall aggregate summary financial value of a brand. And you'll notice there the word estimate is used and we are in territory here where there are no definitive correct answers. All of these measures of brand equity A, overall shareholder value of a brand within an organization are estimates. There are no definitive black and white um, tried and tested answers. Also, there are what are known as financial value methods, and we'll look at a few of those. And these attempt to estimate the unique financial contribution that the brand makes to an organization. So here we're looking at the organization's overall revenue, overall profitability, and trying to disaggregate that to identify the proportion of that which comes directly from one specific brand. So the holistic approach is perhaps the, the most um, uh, uh, overall summary approach that's not necessarily the least accurate, but it, it requires the least information. What you're trying to do there is to provide a top line value uh, for a, a brand. And this is used primarily in the buying and selling of brands and also in brand licensing decisions. If you are going to license your brand name, to a manufacturer of, of clothing, for example, to put your brand name um, on clothing, such as Calvin Klein underwear, for example, or Calvin Klein sportswear or nightwear, which is not manufactured by the Calvin Klein organization, but the brand name is licensed. You need to know how much money to ask 
uh, the manufacturer for the right to use your brand name. So there are some examples here of um, brand values which have been derived using this overall aggregate holistic approach. And you can see the numbers are often pretty big. Um, I think the single biggest number here goes back to 2005 when Procter & Gamble bought Gillette in the USA. So the numbers here are in pounds, British pounds sterling, um, and the amount that was paid in, in equivalent pounds sterling was 31 billion pounds for Gillette. Now, interestingly, only 4 billion pounds of that money was for any sort of tangible asset, like a building or a piece of machinery, and 27 billion pounds was for the intangible brand, the effect of the Gillette brand name, because Gillette is such a um, strong, powerful, leading brand within the shaving product category, both men's and women's shaving products. Procter & Gamble considered that it was worth paying so much money to buy Gillette. Uh, more recently, in 2018, Coca-Cola entered the coffee uh, shop market in the UK, paying almost £4 billion for the Costa coffee chain. So you can see here that the amount of money that is paid for brands as they are bought and sold is quite significant, very, very significant, large sums of money, billions of pounds in many cases. and the um, Overall holistic approach is used to calculate these prices. Let's look now at the financial value methods that sit within this overall holistic approach. So we're trying to get a single value of a brand. There are a number of um, general or generic methodologies, and then there are two uh, proprietary methods owned by specific organizations that I want to talk to you about, Interbrands Brand Valuation Method and the Brand Valuation Method known as Brand Z, which is, um, uh, so, which is developed and, and run by the Kantar Millwood Brown Research Agency. So under the general or generic methods, there we have three possible ways of determining the value of a brand. The first is the cost method. And here we're trying to work out how much it would cost to build the brand from scratch if it disappeared overnight or if it never existed in the first place. So it's a little bit of a hypothetical exercise, but nonetheless, um, it can be done. And this is particularly useful for um, smaller organisations or for single brand organisations. Um, or for smaller brands, how much money would be required to reproduce this brand or indeed to replace it with an equivalent brand, uh, to build it up, to build up its distribution channels, to advertise to the point where you got to the, the brand's current market share, say it had 10% of its market. How much would it cost and how long would it take? So how much money would be needed all by year by year to get that to get a brand to that position in a marketplace. So that's the cost method. Then we have the, the market method, and this is where we calculate the present value of future economic benefits, uh, which the brand owner is going to uh, reap. So we look at the sales, at the market share, uh, possible brand extensions that could be achieved with the brand. And we try to forecast and, and add up um, all those um, economic benefits, licensing benefits, brand extensions, and so on. And the third method is, is sort of related to the market method, but here we're trying to, trying to um, estimate current income or really um, the, the present value of future income from the brand. So how much cash is the brand going to bring in? So the market method is about total economic value of a brand. The income method is about the cash flow that the brand will bring in. 
So we try to forecast the future earnings stream that the brand is going to bring into the organization and then use a discount rate to calculate the net present value of that cash flow. Let's look now at the actual league tables that the um, the two proprietary brand methodology, brand valuation methodologies create. So first of all, we're looking at interbrand brand, brand valuation uh, data. And the table here shows the top 10 global brands in 1990, 2001, 2010, and last year, 2020, according to interbrand. And at the bottom of the slide, there's a hyperlink through to the Interbrand website with the full top 100 global brands for 2020. Now, you can see here that there's been quite a bit of a change uh, in, in the top few brands over the years. Coca-Cola was the number one brand for many years and indeed prior to 1990 had the number one position for, for quite some time. But at some point, between 2010 and 2020, Coca-Cola was knocked off that top spot. And in 2020, the number one brand was Apple, followed by Amazon, Microsoft, Google and Samsung, with Coca-Cola being demoted down to the sixth position. And you can see that as the years have gone on, there's been a change in the type of brands that have dominated the table. If we look back to 1990, we've got Coca-Cola, Kellogg's, McDonald's, Marlboro, Nescafe, all food and drink brands. We've got some services brands um, in American Express. Uh, we've got some durables brands, Kodak, uh, Sony and Mercedes-Benz. And we've got a tobacco brand, Marlboro, at number five. So a lot of fast moving consumer goods here. By 2020, tech dominates the league table. And the top five are all tech brands. Apple and Samsung were the leading brands in the mobile phone market, Amazon, Microsoft, and Google. So significant changes in the types of brands that are considered to be the most valuable according to Interbrand. Now, Interbrand use a combination of the market and the income forecasting methodology. And uh, when you click through to their website, you can read a bit more about how Interbrand actually va value these brands. Let's look now at the Brand Z League tables. Um, the years are not exactly the same. Here we've got 2006, 2008, 2010, and 2020. So the last two columns are the same. And you can see that in 2020, there are some similarities. We've got Amazon, we've got Apple, we've got Microsoft, we've got Google. Uh, we don't have Samsung in the top 10. And we've got some Chinese brands coming in for uh, to the, the brand Z league table, which did not appear in Interbrand. So we've got Alibaba at, at number six, we've got Tencent at number seven. And in previous years, uh, 2006, 8 and 10, China Mobile appeared. So we've got some similarities and we've got some differences. And at the bottom of the slide, there's a, a hyperlink for you to click through to look at the Brand Z website in more depth and detail and to read about their methodology. Now let's put the two together and you can see that there are quite substantial differences. So what I've done here is to show the Brand Z league table in red for 2007 and 2020, and the Interbrand top 10 uh, ranking in black for um, 2007 and uh, 2020. The months are not exactly the same, but the years are the same. And in 2020, I've put in the financial values that each company estimates for each brand in millions of US dollars and look at the differences. So in May 2020, Brand Z estimated that Amazon was worth 415, nearly 416 billion US dollars. The comparable interbrand valuation 
Interbrand having Amazon at number two in their league table, not number one, was less than half that, $200 billion US dollars. So the Interbrand values are all substantially lower than the brand Z values. So does this matter? Well, yes, it does, doesn't it? Imagine you were selling your house and you ask two different estate agents to come and value your house. And one estate agent valued your house at £400,000 and the second estate agent valued your house at a million pounds. You'd be pretty confused, wouldn't you? You wouldn't really know what to do. You'd hope the estate agent that valued it at a million pounds was right, but how could you be sure? Because the difference is so extreme. So what do you do? Do you go with the, the lower estimate and hope to get more potential buyers and a quicker sale? Do you go with the higher estimate and hope that somebody actually does want to pay that much for your house? Or do you think that both estate agents are completely mad and just put your house up for auction and see what the market will actually bear? That's the scenario set out by Mark Ritson in an article where he really questions the validity of brand valuation if we're in this situation where the two leading methodologies differ so very, very much in their estimates of how the brand values are calculated. Now, Mark Ritson um, has written quite a lot about this over the years, uh, much more recently than 2006, but we've got some 2006 references here. He favours the brand Z, brand Z methodology over that of interbrand. Um, brand Z's methodology relies primarily on consumer research data. The, uh, the company that developed brand Z and that, that, um, that offers the, the, the methodology to the market, as I mentioned earlier, is Kantar Millwood Brown, a leading consumer market research agency. And the brand Z models as a starting point is very, very large scale consumer surveys and consumer panels that measure brand performance, brand penetration, uh, purchase frequency, market share, uh, etc. And so Mark Ritson feels that their method is based on more rigorous, more objective, more sound data. Uh, Interbrand's methodology, according to Ritson, relies on subjective subjectivity, uh, expert opinion, and perhaps he says it's too overgeneralized. And uh, Ritson would says that he would always favour a method that's based on hard data than one that is based on expert opinion. So what I would like you to do in preparation for our class session is to do a little bit of reading around on these two key approaches. Look at their websites, read up on their methodology, read Mark Ritson's views or link to all his articles on the Canvas page and indeed to other um, commentators uh, about these two approaches and come to class ready to discuss the differences between them, what you think about them, whether you think it matters that they have such different valuations for brands and what we should do about this as a community of marketing and brand management experts. Essentially, all of these techniques, as I said um, a, a little while ago, are estimates. There is no magic 100% accurate number uh, for the value of any brand. And so all estimates have limitations. They are subject to um, the, the accuracy of the input data, uh, the robustness of the methodology and so on. Um, but the fact that we have two dominant approaches in the market, which come up with such very differing numbers, does worry many people. And indeed, Ritson has also said that ranking brands, as we've seen in these league tables, by their financial brand equity is becoming a disaster. And um, the, the wide discrepancies are bringing the whole area of brand valuation into disrepute. And as a result, damage is being done to the profession of brand management. So let's discuss this in more depth and detail at our class session.
So here are some links for you to click through to to prepare yourself for the class session. The first is a link to a, a video. It's quite a long video. It lasts for about 45 minutes. So take some set aside some time or watch it in stages. And um, it's actually a, a, a really useful video for, for us to, to talk about in class because it's a debate between Mark Ritson and people from the leading brand valuation organizations, people from Interbrand, people from the Brand Z organization, Cantar Millward Brown, and people from a third organization that has a brand valuation methodology that I haven't really mentioned in detail, an organization called Brand Finance. And I apologize for the spelling mistake on the screen there. That should say valuation, not valutation. Um, and also, I'll also just put a little government health warning. There is some uh, profanity, some swearing uh, in the video. Uh, and then there's a second link to Mark Ritson's article. What is the point of brand valuation if the values are so off target? So lots of things for you to listen to. So all of these methods are subject to limitations. There is no single 100 percent totally accurate number for brand value. Uh, these are different views, all of which are subject to limitations based on their methodology and data and so on. And the main limitations are set out in uh, on this slide here. Uh, some data can be very subjective, particularly the so-called expert opinion uh, used in the interbrand methodology. Uh, intangible assets don't always directly translate into brand equity. Just because you have a brand doesn't mean it's going to end up earning shareholder value, earning money for an organization, working through the brand value chain in a, a, a positive and dynamic way. Uh, some of the methods lack what researchers refer to as face validity. In other words, they don't really make much sense um, when you start to unpick and look in detail at the nuts and bolts of how the calculations are made. And for a method to be accepted, it should be simple and straightforward to understand by anyone, not just financial experts or accountants. Um, the uh, financial measures which the, the different methodologies create can in some cases be overly um, reliant on what the brand has done in the past. They primarily can be based on past data, past brand performance. And as we know in forecasting, uh, the, the future does not always directly reflect the past. And so just because a brand has been strong in the past in a particular part of the world doesn't mean that that will necessarily continue into the future. The marketing environment can change. The regulatory environment can change. Competition can change. As we said, as I said back at the, the beginning of the session, actually separating out any one brand as a separable intangible asset from all of the other tangibles and intangibles in an organization is very very hard to do and is totally um, subject to to um, opinion and therefore subjectivity it can be done in different ways and we know now from our Ehrenbergian uh, data that uh, it is possible to misinterpret market share information, brand performance metrics, and to, to uh, interpret these in incorrect ways. So a number of limitations on brand valuation. So take time to look at the resources on Canvas, click through to the videos, read the articles, read up on the interbrand methodology and the brand Z methodology, and come to class ready to discuss. But for now, that's all. Thank you and goodbye.